some class, all right? Yeah, I'm talking to you that are walking off. Have a good class. That was what? Didn't even acknowledge me. Well, hello. How are you guys? Well, let's say hello to Jim and Dory, who uh, I don't usually check my emails during service, but we were emailing back and forth there in Jerusalem, getting ready to go to bed, and uh, they're tuning in, so hello to them uh, this morning. And if you're visiting with us, my name's Jeremy. I'm one of the uh, pastors here at Crossroads, and we're excited to have you. If you're visiting with us, we're just excited that you chose to join us this morning. And uh, if you'd like to know a little bit more about who we are as a church, um, or if you have some questions or whatnot, after service, right out in the, in the lobby there, there's a welcome center. And we've got a, uh, a gift for you, a coffee mug, just as a way to say thanks for coming. And if you have any questions, there'll be some of us that'll be back there uh, to answer some of those questions. So uh, thanks again for visiting with us. And there's a lot going on in the life of the church. I'm going to highlight one announcement this morning. And that is, for those of you that have kids in the youth program here at the church, uh, we are connecting with International Justice Mission and piloting what they're calling a 24-hour justice experience this Friday and Saturday here at the church. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about um, justice issues, not only locally but around the world. And so some of what we're going to be talking about is human trafficking. We're going to be talking uh, a little bit about forced labor. We're going to be talking about runaways in the United States and how many of them are forced into prostitution. And so we're going to be talking about some really intense subjects. And so I wanted you as parents to know um, we're going to be partnering also with an organization locally called Love Justice. Love Justice is out of the Boise Vineyard, and they do a lot locally with, with what's happening with trafficking and other things in, in our community and in the Northwest. Portland is one of the four top places in the United States where women are trafficked um, through Portland. So it's in our backyard, and we're along I-84, which is also uh, one of the hubs. And so we're going to expose our kids to some things that are happening in the world because we believe that prayer matters. And so with that, we're going to have some intense time of prayer. Um, But I wanted you parents to know that we're going to be showing a couple of PG-13 movies that have to do with women who have been trafficked and other things. And so I wanted you to be aware so that I don't get the emails on Saturday or Sunday, but so that you're aware that this is a topic that we're, we're going to explore and talk about. And then later that evening on Saturday night, the, thing, uh, the, the justice experience will run from 5 to 5. And, um, and then any high schoolers that are interested, we're going to connect with the International Justice Mission Idaho and uh, they're doing a concert, and one of the speakers from IJM will be in town. And so we're going to join them for that on Saturday night. We're calling it the After Hours Justice Experience. But it's for high schoolers because it's high school and college. So with that being said, I don't have any other announcements. Um, with the wonder of technology, uh, Pastor Jim and Dory will be back with us next week. But through the wonders of technology, they uh, have uh, sent us a video from Jerusalem. Well, it's not good to see you. I can't see you. You can see me, uh, but we're here in Israel, and uh, we'll we'll be back with you next week. But we are seeing so much of the Bible come alive. This is an amazing book. And right here within eye view, I'm looking over here to my left at the Mount of Olives, and so much took place there. I'm looking to my south to David's city where David's palace was. It's an amazing place. But I want to share just something about the place I'm standing in right now. This is the southern entrance to the temple. In fact, the stones at the base of the temple here are actually Solomonic. So Solomon laid these stones. Now, yes, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. It's been rebuilt. But those original stones and archways are original to first century. So it would have been been on these steps that Jesus walked. These steps, though, are, are interesting. They're There are different heights and and lengths. At at our own homes, we, we, we build our steps all to be the same size so that we can go up and down without thinking. These steps were designed to make you think. And so on these steps, the rabbis would gather, even in the wintertime on a cold day like today, uh, it's warm out here. So they would gather with their disciples and teach them. So you think about that when Jesus would have come out and talked to them about being whitewashed tombs. Just to my left, the whole hillside of the Mount of Olives is filled with whitewashed tombs. It's an amazing thing. And so it was on these steps that Mary and Joseph walked up to bring the baby Jesus 
to be circumcised on his eighth day. And where Simeon and Anna stood and, and, and found the fulfillment of everything that they had dreamed of. It was on these steps that at the age of 12, Jesus would have gathered with those rabbis, teaching them about biblical prophecy. And it was on these steps, too, that Jesus went in. Because just inside these arched doors are where the money changers would have been. And it was here that he drove out the money changers, saying, I do not agree with this kind of religion. And it's an amazing part of history right here. So when you think about it, some psalms were written called Psalms of Ascent. To ascend, or Aliyah, we've talked about that before, to go up to the temple. So the Psalms of Ascent were meant for that, but, but they were also meant to be, to be said and spoken as you ascended the steps. These steps that make you think. Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together. Oh, man, that's true. So much history is right here within eye view. And, and it was these steps that Jesus would, would go in and out throughout his three years of ministry. But also... There was another thing that took place here. In Acts chapter 2, the story is told that at the day of Pentecost, a mighty rushing wind was heard, and the Holy Spirit came upon the believers. And the people who had gathered here for the Jewish festival of of, uh, Pentecost heard this sound. And Peter, this Peter who had just, oh, I can see the place where Caiaphas' house would have been, just Within eyesight of here, where 50 days earlier he, he denied his, his Savior, he's standing on these steps preaching boldly in the power of the Spirit to the people gathered there. And he says these words to them. He says um, in verse 34 of chapter 2, It was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Here's the kicker. David's tomb... Is right over there. It's amazing. So he could point right there. It's not David. This is the ascendant of David, the descendant of David, Jesus. He goes on. He says he goes on to preach to him and who this Jesus was. And it says in verse 37, when they heard these words, they were cut to the heart, and they said, "What must we do to be saved?" And Peter says, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you." So here's. Well, we have some Israeli uh, helicopters going over right now. So if you can't hear me, I'm going to pause. I feel very safe here, just, just so you know, okay? In case you decide to come back with us at some point. Very safe. Okay, right below here, in the last 10 years, they have uncovered 30 mikvah pools, <laughs> baptismals. Uh, some were for men and some were for women. And this is the way they prepared to go into the temple. It could have been right here in this very moment. It says 3,000 were added to their number that day and were baptized. That's 100 per, per mikvah. That's no big deal. It happened right here. This is amazing stuff, you guys. And so we're excited to come home. We're excited to help uh, you in your own Bible reading, to help the Bible come alive. We're going to bring back more pictures, I'm sure. I'm sorry. If you're bored with pictures, sorry, but we're going to have some fun. And so we're excited to be with you. But let me close with the rest of of Psalm 122. Uh, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say peace be within you. I will, I, for the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. It's been great. Talking to you this morning. Looking forward to getting back with you. Shalom. Oh. Jordan, that was her best work. A panning. I'm teasing. If Dory's watching, I'm sorry. But I feel safe here. I just want you to know, I feel safe. <laughs> Hard act to follow, he is. Uh, we, we miss you, Jim, and look forward to having you back. Uh, it's been an interesting week, a good week, a tough week. 
Um, in case you don't know, Jim, uh, Ken's mom, Faye, went to be with the Lord this week. So we've been carrying that burden. Um, but the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And with Grandma Faye, I don't have any lack of assurance. I know right where she's at. And she was probably worshiping with us this morning, although she was probably a little bit miffed because she's all into Gaither music and we didn't do any of that today. <laughs> so, Grandma, we're sorry. We've been talking about, in this three-week sort of a short series, what, what God is like. And we began with a quote from Tozer which says something like this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I would argue that that is never more true than when the chips are down, than when someone that we love dies. It is critically important what we think about God. Who, who is this God into whose hands we entrust the keeping of this loved one of ours? And so we've been unpacking this idea about what God is like for several weeks. Jeremy talked to us about the person of the Holy Spirit, and he reminded us correctly that the Holy Spirit is, in fact, God, God himself, and that he is personal. He is not an it. He is a person who abides with us and guides us and teaches us and convicts us and leads us and empowers us, etc. He is very actively involved in our lives as the person of the Trinity that brings Christ into our very hearts. He'll abide with us forever, Jesus said. Then last week we looked at God the Father, and there the question wasn't so much, is the Father God? That's not very controversial. The question is, what is the Father like? The Father who is God, what's he like? What is his heartbeat? What is his character? And we unpacked Psalm 103 a little bit to to see there the acts that God does, and his character. And so this morning now we come to the second person of the Trinity. And now the first thing that I think about when we come to the person of the Son um, is this, which is a somewhat obvious perhaps truth, but it's nonetheless true. The person of the Son, the eternal Son of God, has always been. Now, When we think about the Son, we often call him by the name of Jesus, which is correct, right? Or we say Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah. It's hard for us to think about the second person of the Trinity apart from his incarnation. And yet, if you will, for just a moment, think with me about that. Think about the reality, which is very true, that the Son has always been. The Son has no beginning. The Son has always been in a relationship with the Father and the Spirit for all eternity. And so if you were to try to, and you can't really represent that, draw that, it is a timeline that goes infinitely backwards. It has no beginning point. This is critical uh, truth that the Bible tells us. And so we try to understand who the Son is. And I want to use John's uh, Gospel I want to start there at least. And so if you have your Bibles with you, turn to John chapter 1. Probably the, the strongest. There are lots of places in the Bible that we can see this son described, but this is one of the clearest. So John is beginning to answer the question for us this morning, what is God like in terms of the person of the son? What is the son of God like, the eternal son of God What's he like? And here John begins in the prologue of of John, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning. Time out. That sounds like Genesis 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, etc. Not the same beginning, right? Because if you heard what I've said so far, the son that John's going to begin to describe here, the Logos, he doesn't have a beginning. In the beginning, Genesis 1, God... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit creates everything that comes to be. This is a different time frame. In fact, I would argue this is eternity past. Before the beginning, if we can say that, the Word, the Logos, already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Time out. How can that be true? The Word, the Logos, we now know it's the person of the Son of God. We'll see that in a moment. 
was with God and was God. So how can you be both with God and be God? Welcome to the Trinity. This is who the Son is. Whether I can understand it or not is really not even secondary. It's irrelevant. It's just true. So this word was with God and was God. Notice verse 2, he existed in the beginning with God. God, that is the Father, created everything through him. Nothing was created except through him. And he goes on to say the Son animated everything. Skip ahead to verse 14. So the word or the Logos became human. Important point here. He didn't just take on a body. The word became flesh. It's not just God with a body like a man. He actually took to himself a human nature. I know this is, this is tough sledding this morning. He became man in every respect. He became fully human. And so in the Lord Jesus Christ, when he becomes incarnate, we have human nature and divine nature coexisting in one person. So the word became human or flesh and made his home among us or tabernacled with us. He was full of unfailing love. There it is, charis and faithfulness, truth. We've seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Now, if you mark in your Bible, some of you don't. You could circle that. We're going to come back to it. One and only Son. Some of you have only begotten. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. In earthly terms, John is older than Jesus, the man. So John the Baptist is referring to this eternal one who has always been, who existed long before him. From his abundance, we've all received one gracious blessing after another. Charis upon charis. For the law was given through Moses... But God's unfailing love, his charis and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. I think he's referring primarily to the Father. But the unique one, there it is again, same term we read earlier, the one and only, the unique one, the only begotten one, who is himself God, is near to the Father's heart or in the bosom of the Father. He has revealed God to us. So this one that we're reading about this morning as we begin, we're answering the question, what is he like? What is the person of the Son like? And the first answer to the question is he is very God of very God. He has no beginning point. He is the eternal Son of an eternal Father, living eternally with Father and Spirit. And I know we can't comprehend that, but it's, it's important that we believe that. It's critical later on in John's gospel, if you were to to page forward, John chapter 8, you don't have to go there, I'll tell you the story. Jesus gets in an argument with the Jews about Abraham and Abraham's kids, who are the real kids of Abraham. At the end of the argument, Jesus says this statement in verse 58, which is really radical. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And you go like, yeah, that's not that big a deal. That's a big deal. That reminded them of Exodus 3.14, where God in the burning bush told Moses when he asked, who should I tell him sent me? Tell him I am sent you. Jesus himself identifies himself as very God of very God. They take up stones and they're going to kill him. So there's evidence that we understand him right. So he's very God of very God. In the early church for about the first 500 years was focused on this question. Who is Jesus, who is the Son? You see, the the Jewish people for all these years had been told so many times, true statement, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? There's one God. And so here came this one sent from the Father who's saying, I am, about himself. And they're going, what? Then they saw him live, and they saw him die, and they saw him be resurrected. And so the early church and the apostles in the first days for about the next 500 years, are focused primarily on this question. Who is he? So you can imagine we're not going to do justice to it in 30 or 35 minutes this morning. There was a lot of blood shed over this question. 
But the early church came to some consensus in regard to some of the creeds, the ecumenical creeds of the church, one of which is the Nicene Creed. This is the revised Nicene Creed I have in your bulletin. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. We'll come back to that. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. That's critical. He has no beginning point. He's not made of one being with the Father. Through him, this one, all things were made. So my first answer to the question is, what's he like? In his essence or in his being, he is very God of very God. He's eternally God. God the Son. So my second answer to the question, what, what's he like in his character? Turn in your Bibles, you're in John. Turn over to chapter 5. Jesus is having a discussion with the Jews, again, about the Sabbath. He's just done some good stuff on the Sabbath, and so they're ticked off. They were pretty uptight about this stuff. And so Jesus, in explaining why he's doing what he's doing, notice what he says in verse 19. Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him, that is the Son, everything he's doing. So Jesus, in the middle of this argument, is talking about his relationship with the Father. And I would say this isn't just about Jesus the Son after his incarnation in his ministry. It's true. But for all eternity, the Son and the Father have been doing what they do. They've, the Son has always done what he's observed the Father doing. They've always worked in perfect harmony and agreement. And so it's true here in John chapter 5 that the Son is doing what the Father is doing. Well, what was the Father doing last week in Psalm 103? Forgiving all of our iniquities, healing all of our diseases, crowning our life, satisfying us with good things, etc., is what the Son does. The Father and the Son have this more than a family resemblance. If you were to go ahead, and you don't need to go there, I'm just going to summarize it. John chapter 14 in the upper room, Jesus is meeting with the disciples. He's just washed their feet. And then you hit the 14th chapter, and Philip, I think, is starting to get a clue that, well, there's, there's big stuff coming down the pike here. And so he says to the Master, show us the Father, Right? I think in the Old King James, show us the Father and it will suffice us. I don't think Philip spoke that way, by the way. (laughs) Jesus says, really? I mean, mean, you have to catch that. I'm sure Jesus was at least a tad, perhaps sarcastic. Are you kidding me? Show us the... I mean, how long have we been hanging out, Philip? Three years. You've been with me. That's what disciples do with their rabbi. We've been living together, and you're really going to say, hey, show us the Father. Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. means that everything the Father does and is, the Son does and is. And so all the stuff we talked about last week, the Father is compassionate. Guess what the major attribute is? regarding the Son in His earthly ministry was noted to be compassion. We said last week the Father was gracious, the Hebrew term for grace. What did we just read about the Son? Full of charis. Full of it. Last week we said the Father is abounding in hesed, this covenant loyalty, this covenant faithfulness, What did the Son say to us? I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He's also intensely loyal. Last week we said the Father is slow to anger. This week we can look at the Son and say, yeah, He's pretty patient too. But just like the Father, you can push Him to a point, right? He goes, Jim was just talking about it, goes into the temple and cleans house, saying this should be a house of prayer. You guys are not doing it right So just like the Father can be angry, the Son can be angry, but neither of them, nor does the Holy Spirit, live in anger. It's just not how they are. That's not how they're disposed toward us. And so last week I I was blessed to hear myself say it. The Father is not living in anger toward us. I think lots of you needed to hear that. I needed to hear that. 
It's a critical point. So who is this eternal son of God? Well, he's very God of very God, and in his character and actions, he looks just like the father. But thirdly, he's in a unique relationship with the father. This is where you get a little bit of a headache, so take your Tylenol now. He's the eternal son of the eternal father. And you can't use your human kinds of thoughts about this, right? Because it's not a chicken and egg question. Okay, which came first? Wrong. So I don't care which way you want to look at it. They are in an eternal relationship, father and son, in, in such a way that the father doesn't beget him like we think about begetting. So then why did John use that term? We read it, and it was translated in in the NLT in chapter 1 two times, the one and only or the one of a kind. It also appears, you know, the most famous verse in the Bible, right? God, It's at the football games, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. See, we've all memorized it in the King James, which is fine. There it is. That's the word I want to talk about for just a minute. It's the word in Greek, monogenes. That blessed you, didn't it? Mono Ganes. John uses it two times in chapter 1, two times in chapter 3, and then he uses it in 1 John 4. So John uses the term quite a bit, and the term is used about the Son of God, so it's a critical part of our understanding, this, this Mono Ganes. Mono means probably, like you might be hearing there, Mono meaning one or only. One. This idea of one. Not mono, like mono e mono. That's a different kind, right? That's that's a different. Mono, that fell really flat, Jeremy. <laughs> mono, it worked in the first service a little bit. I don't know. Mono is one, okay? So mono, genes. Now, here's the debate within the church. That word genes either comes from one of two places. It either comes from the word genao, which means to beget, the verb to beget. Or it comes from the noun genos, which means kind of like you biology majors, any biology majors here, genus, you heard of genus, right? Kind of means like a type or a group or a, it's, I mean, I did terrible in biology. It's like a species or something. So you can see that it, it either means only begotten as that translation stuck in the early church in the Latin Vulgate and we've kind of carried it on. We read it in the career. You can see it in the Nicene Creed I've got in your bulletin. Or it means one of a kind or unique, which is the translation the NLT picks up. What's critical, and and I'm okay with using the only begotten term, but don't misunderstand it. It does not ever mean that Jesus was created, begotten, made, had a beginning. No. What it means is that he is the son of who is uniquely the Son. He's in a unique relationship with the Father, and this term monogenes is applied to him. Now, for those who are interested, Hebrews 11, I think it's verse 17, calls Isaac Abraham's monogenes. Abraham had more than one child. Right? Do the homework. He did. But Isaac was the unique son of the promise. So the writer of Hebrews uses the word monogenes to describe Isaac as the unique one, the child of promise one. And John, I believe, means first and foremost, Jesus, the Son of God, is the only begotten of the Father. He's in a unique unique relationship with the Father. But he's also called, in Matthew 3, the Father himself says at the baptism of Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He proclaims it to those who had ears to hear that day. This is the Son whom I love. And so Jesus is in a relationship with the Father that in some ways is unique. He's the only one, the one and only, the unique Son of the Father. But it's a relationship of love. And what's interesting about that is that the first part of that, the uniqueness of that relationship is something that we will never share. We'll benefit from the unity in the Trinity, but we'll never share it. But that second part, here's the gospel. The second part is that God in Christ brings us into that relationship. 
so that we are loved like the Son is loved. That's the gospel. That's the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is not, even though this is important, we're justified by grace alone through faith alone. That's a means to an end. God justifies us so that the barrier between him and us can be removed so we can have a full relationship. See, God's not just interested in saving us and taking us to heaven. He's interested in that, but that's a means to an end. He wants a relationship with us, an eternal relationship with us. He wants to be with us. Now that may really? I don't like me that much. Why would he like me that much? He does. And so Jesus is in a unique relationship to the Father. And then fourthly, I would say, in addition to him being very God of very God, in addition to him being just like the Father in the way that he acts and in his character, and in addition to his unique relationship with the Father, I would say, lastly, who is he? What's he like? He's in a unique relationship to us. Now, this is somewhat mind-blowing for us to think about. This is the goal of the incarnation. We won't turn there for the sake of time, but 1 Corinthians 15 has tons of hope. It talks about the second man, Adam, and if he's raised, we're raised. So we're going to be there as sure as he's there. You see, we have a man in heaven, the God-man, Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and men. And as sure as he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father, then you and I, when we close our eyes in this life, we will open them in the next with him. And so we're in this unique relationship, and it's all because of the Son. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 2 describes this unique relationship. The writer of Hebrews is writing this letter, among other things, I think his thesis is, Jesus is better. Great place to go if you're new to the Bible, new to Christianity, want to understand more about Jesus, the book of Hebrews is a great place to go. How is Jesus better? Well, one of the ways he's better is that because he's become man, because he's condescended, because he came down to us, Now we have this new relationship with the Father. Notice verse 11. So now the writer says, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, made flesh after he's died and been raised, and the ones he makes holy have the same Father. If that doesn't strike you as profound, you're not thinking hard enough. Maybe we're too used to hearing it. That's huge. Me and Jesus have the same Father. He's in a unique relationship with the Father as the Son, and because He's become man and died and was raised, and now I'm in Him, I have the same love relationship with the Father that He does. And that's why Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Now, we call each other brother and sister, right? Hey, bro. Hey, sis. The truth here of Hebrews is that Jesus is our brother. Now, again, don't mess up what I've already said. He is very God of very God. We're not becoming God. But we're being brought into the family of God in such a way that Jesus is legitimately our brother. The Son of God brings us into the family of God, and he's not ashamed of us. Now, that's that's important. Because he says to God, you've got the Trinity all over this thing, if they're not two distinct persons, how can they talk to one another? Because he says to God, Jesus does, I'll proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. When I... When I'm raised, I'm going to proclaim your name, Father, to my brothers and my sisters. I'll praise you among your assembled people. He also said, I'll put my trust in him, that is, I and the children God has given me. Now, here I like the NIV. Here's what it says. Here I am, Father, and the children you gave me. There's the picture. The picture is Jesus the Son, the unique Son of the Father, who left the glories of God to become man for us, 
lived, died, and was raised on the third day, when he is raised and he goes back to the Father, this is the picture. He's saying, Father, I'm back. Here I am. And guess who's right with him? Us. That's the picture. So he's not ashamed of us. He's saying, Father, here I am and the ones you gave me, the very ones that you gave me, these are the ones, Hebrews 12, 2 talks about the joy that was set before him. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. What joy? What joy? I mean, it's not joyful dying on a cross, right? It's horrible. What's holding him there? What's constraining him? in those moments of agony as he takes upon himself the sin of the world. The joy. What joy? The fact that once he goes through it and is victorious, he gets these trophies of grace. Now, I don't feel like a trophy, do you? But the Bible says he thinks we are. The Bible says we are his prized possession. The Bible says we are his bride but you see, the Bible is, it has a hard time trying to communicate some of this stuff. So it's painting pictures. Like, how, how do I tell them, the writers of Scripture, as the Holy Spirit inspired, how, how do I communicate? Well, describe it like a bride. Tell them they're his prized possession. Tell them that they are his inheritance. Psalm 2, which we don't have time to go to, but you can look it up, is describing the Son after he's resurrected and ascended, and, and he's talking to the father and he says, the father says to the son, what do you want for your inheritance? And he says, us. That's what I want. I want them for my inheritance. And so what we see lastly is that Jesus, the unique son of God, has brought us smack dab into the Trinity. Not in such a way that we become God. That line is still real. Does that make sense? God is still God and we're not. But in Christ, we're brought right into the middle of the family. And so we are loved just like the Son is loved. We have the same Father as the Son. And it's all because the Trinity agreed in eternity past to conspire. I'm going to use that word on purpose. To send the Son to become flesh. To take on humanity, which by the way, he didn't take back off. Where is he right now? He still has his humanity. 1 Corinthians 15, I have a man at the right hand of the presence of God, which is my confidence that when I die, I too will be raised. So you can see how the Trinity is not some dusty thing, right? Or some, some kind of basic doctrine that we should teach in Sunday school and move on. You can see the Trinity is right at the heart of the gospel. The Trinity is right at the heart of where we live. All of those analogies, I, I am so sorry, all you Sunday school teachers, but just dump them all. The egg, the water, whatever else you can come up with, the three-leaf clover of St. Patrick, that they don't work. So it's harder for us to, to not only teach adults this truth, but let alone teach children, but try as best you can to teach the truth because... What I think about when I think about God is the most important thing about me and how I think God is. What is he like? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit affects my life at the very core, especially when the chips are down, especially when it's life and death. That's our hope. Our hope is in this God, three in one, and in the way through the Son who became flesh and rose again we will be forever in the presence of that God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jeremy. So we've been uh, asking this question, Andy and I, over the past uh, several weeks as we've started this uh, look at the Trinity, but specifically this week we asked the question, okay, so what do we want to walk away with? Anytime I do a message, I, um, I write four words at the bottom of the page. I write the words, so what? And I write the words, what now? Because I feel like um, we, a lot of times, uh, we hear sermons and we wrestle with things, but we sometimes miss out on the application. 
how do we apply what we've been learning for the past couple of weeks? And to be honest, you know, Andy said that the church has been has been fighting over this for especially the first 500 years. Well, it didn't end. Just the year 500, everything got okay. There's still struggles. And when we talk about the Trinity, a, a lot of us, it, it's, it's so hard to get our minds around that, that, that it challenges, well, it challenges, if we're honest, our theological boxes. And I think a lot of us, because, especially because we live in the, in the West, we have a Western mindset, and part of having a Western mindset is actually this concept of making sure that everything that we believe theologically fits all nice and tight in this nice little box. And the problem with that becomes when we come to a passage or when we come to a subject like the Trinity and it doesn't fit all nice and neat into our box, the question becomes, what do we do with it? And I think if we're honest, the church for a long time said, we don't want to touch that because it doesn't fit nice and neat into a theological box. I have a friend who, um, he said, you know what I've learned, Jeremy? I've learned that I call God Jehovah Sneaky. Because every time I think I got him figured out, he does something else. And I think when it comes to the Trinity, we can apply that truth. Like, we we think we we understand it, but but the truth is it's really hard. And so, the the so what? The so what of this series that we've been talking about? Well, our hope is that for some, that as you've wrestled with this big concept called the Trinity, that... For some of you, it's maybe the realization that maybe in my life I have maybe held up one part of the Trinity above others. I mean, if I'm honest, when I look back at my life, I've seen several uh, times in my life where there was a moment, and this isn't wrong, but it's, it's important for us to acknowledge it and keep it in the proper perspective. But I've, I've known part of the times in my life where it was only Jesus. I just studied Jesus. I just looked at the New Testament and, and, and didn't realize, perhaps, that the Old Testament was actually the Bible that Jesus was using, specifically the first five books. And, and so I, didn't, I, just, I just dove into Jesus and all the things that Jesus was doing. And that's great, but there are other pieces to the Trinity. And then there's a time in my life when it was really all about the Father, all about God the Father. And if I'm honest with you, it was during that time that that God was actually healing some things in my life. He was healing some of the father wounds and father issues that I have, and I'm probably not alone in this room, of people who maybe have have experienced uh, some hurt or misunderstanding or strained relationships with earthly fathers. And, And many of us, if we're honest, we carry that over into our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so there was a time in my life when I was learning what does it mean to connect with the Father heart of God and as Andy shared last week, compassion and, and mercy and love and what does that look like for me? And then as I shared in week one, there was a part of my life, a part of my journey where the Holy Spirit was really what I was coming to understand and I was wrestling with what does it mean to, uh, to, to have a ho- the Holy Spirit as part of what was happening in my life. And so... I, I really do believe that, that it's important for us to have those experiences, but I think the overarching so what from the series for us is that the Trinity, as hard as it is to, for, for us to wrap our minds around, is really important. Because what Tozer says is really true. What we believe about God can become the most important thing about us. How we see the Trinity, how we, how we live out day in and day out what we believe about the Trinity becomes the most important thing about us. And so as I was kind of thinking, how do you wrap this whole thing up? I mean, first off, I can't believe that we tried to take the Trinity on in three weeks. I don't know what we were thinking. But but I came across Augustine. And and he was one of the early church fathers who was wrestling with the Trinitarian God. And I, I found this quote that I thought was really interesting. He said, if you don't have a Trinitarian God... You don't have a perfect God. And, and, and when I first read that, I, I did one of those, like some of you just did, like, huh? Well, what, do you, what do you mean by that? If you don't have a Trinitarian God, you don't have a perfect God. But he went on to say, if you have one God as one person, then you're saying that God did not have a personal relationship until he created someone else. Or another way of looking at it is God was lonely, so that's why he created someone else. And when we look at the, the, the Trinity, one of the biggest pictures that we see, one of the things that just, that just jumps off the pages of Scripture again and again and again is relationship. Trinity is an, is an awesome example of relationship. 
and the importance of relationship. You, you see glimpses of it. You see that passage, and just because of time, we won't go there. But in Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus comes out of the water, you see the Trinity. Like, I know it's hard for us because we imagine, because of that passage, the Spirit coming like a dove. And so you get all these images of the Spirit like a dove, and that's not right. But in the sense, like, right, the, the Spirit of God ascending, and, and then God saying, this is my Son. You see this imagery right here, and it arises from the pages that it's about relationship. That's the imagery that, 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 that's created when you look at, at the Trinity throughout Scripture. The Trinity shows this love that's intrinsic from the beginning because we see this relational God. Augustine went on to say, yeah, there are problems in understanding the Trinity. And here's somebody who, who spent a lot of time wrestling with the Trinity and talking about it and writing about it. And he went on to say, there are problems with the Trinity. But I love this line. But without the Trinity, you have even bigger problems. That's what he said. You can't understand God apart from the Trinity. And yeah, it's messy. And yeah, it doesn't make sense. And yeah, it's hard to understand. But without the Trinity, without even, even, even having a conversation about the Trinity or inviting the Trinity into our lives, we have even bigger problems. And so, one of the biggest now what's for us as we come to the end of this time together I think it's seen the Missio Dei, or the mission of God. You see, I think that you can see throughout Scripture the mission of God, and you can see it exemplified in the Trinity, because the mission of God is constantly pursuing us, coming after us. I mean, you see it in the garden, you see it throughout, throughout history. Now, the problem with this, with this statement that I just made is, is that many of us, when we hear us, we think that the Bible is all about me. This is all about me. But, but the truth of the matter is, it's about God. And God coming into our world. Why? Because He loves us. It's a relational thing. It's God moving towards us. Andy shared a, a book that he read in, in his process of just kind of studying this. It's called Life in the Trinity. And, 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 and there was a, a passage that he read to me that I said, I, I need that passage. I need to dwell on that and think about this. And this is what the author says. That God is constantly moving down towards us. He said, first the Father sent His Son down. Then the Father and the Son sent the Spirit down. Later God will send the Son again. And finally, stunningly, the Father will come down, bringing heaven and all the heavenly hosts with Him. You see, what the Trinity does is it paints for us this picture of a God who's constantly breaking right into our world. And so I love how Jude talks about this. This is the last time we did a sermon out of Jude. This is a great book, by the way. But but in this, at the end, as he's talking, he says, this is this call to perseverance. And he says, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. That they said to you in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are men who divide you who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But then he says these words, but you, dear friends. And I really believe he, he's, talking, he's talking to the church, right? But you, dear friends, build yourselves up. And look at how he says to build yourselves up in this most holy faith. He says, first, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Do so you see this imagery of Jude talking about the Holy Spirit? Keep yourself in God's love. As you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. You see a beautiful imagery of the Trinity in those those words. As we're wrestling with our most holy faith, we're praying the Holy Spirit would come. We're keeping ourselves in God's love and we're waiting for the mercy that's revealed through our Lord Jesus Christ that will bring us into eternal life. And so I want to ask you this morning, with the last now what of our series, if you would do something with me. Would you just close your eyes this morning? And let's just reflect on what we've talked about over the past several weeks. But let's even more than that, let's invite this morning the Trinitarian God, the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's invite him to continue the work that he's already been doing in our lives. So for 
some today, it literally might be the Father heart of God. It might be that, what we talked about last week, the compassion of a Father. The abounding love of a Father. Maybe for some, that's been a disconnect and really hard. And this morning, I believe that the Father heart of God just wants to minister to you today. So would you be open to that? Letting God just minister to you through the Father heart. Maybe for some of you today, what Pastor Andy talked about, the uniqueness of the Son and how the Son invites us into this relationship with the Father. Maybe for some of you, you've never, you've never said yes to Jesus. Maybe for some of you, you've got maybe a distorted view of what that all looks like. Would you let the Holy Spirit, just through the power of who He is and what He's doing, would you let Jesus just come and minister to you today? And truly, maybe it is for some of you, it's the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, it's a mystery, it's a, it's a little scary. That doesn't quite fit into my box theologically. I don't know what to do with the Spirit. Well, would you just trust the Trinity, that God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit wants to just minister to you today? Whatever burden you might be carrying, whatever you might be going through, So I just want to wait just a minute, just want to give you a minute, just in silence, to respond to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, any way, and then I'll close this out in just a minute. God, we recognize that when even we say the word God, that there are so many images and so many pictures and so many things that might be confusing for us. We acknowledge that. But Father God, we thank you for your heart. We thank you for your love. And unique Son, Jesus, we thank you that you've invited us in be a part of this thing that you're doing in the world around us. And Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that we need you to be able to walk this thing out. And so Lord, thank you for your great love. Thank you for the picture that the Trinity paints for us of a God on mission and a God who loves us and a God who's constantly running after us and a God who's seeking us and a God who's desiring relationship with us and a God who looks at us and doesn't see how we oftentimes look at ourselves but you see us as trophies and it blows my mind so God this morning I know that my brothers and sisters across this room have lots of different expressions and ideas and things that might be swirling around in their mind, but I just pray, God, that you would speak directly to hearts today. We thank you, God, that you don't leave us or forsake us, that you go with us. So, God, today, would you go with us as we walk out these doors and into the world? Empower us, strengthen us, Help us to live in relationship with you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. May you this week experience the beautiful picture of the Trinity at work in your life. Through God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you as you go this week.